Hey, everybody. So if you have been hanging out with us for the last couple seasons of the podcast, you probably remember us mentioning Flaw Tootie in our past episodes. Our friend Molly Sharp, who incidentally was also a guest in season one, started Vla Tootie to share her awesome duet arrangements of standard viola rep, which are great for teaching, and it has now grown into a wide range of catalog of one-of-a-kind resources for violists and beyond. Steph, do you remember when we played one of the duets from a holiday bundle together? Yes, it's one of my most cherished holiday memories. Aww. But actually, one of my favorites is something that all string instrumentalists would love. It's called Making Double Stops Ring, a guided exploration of just intonation. And Molly actually shared the viola version with us last year, and I am not exaggerating when I say that it completely changed the way I think about intonation. No one has ever explained it to me like this before. I think that we all realize on some level that a B in all situations is not the same, but why? Yeah. Have you ever had that classic argument in a string quartet setting when you're trying to oh, tune yes. a chord and and maybe we're playing that B and we're being told, no, it needs to go lower. No, it needs to go higher. It needs to go here. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be amazing to save all those hours for our string quartet students with no debate? We just know where it's supposed to go. Everyone agrees because there's only one way. <laughs> right. You can just gift them copies of this book. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Nothing personal. Just here's a book about intonation. <laughs> well, Molly has made it easy for all of us to play in tune. So whether you play viola, violin, cello, or bass, there's a version for you. You can find this pragmatic book, viola duet arrangements of classic viola repertoire, and so much more at vlatutti.com under Marketplace. Or look in this episode's show notes. Steph and I got to be standees this past week. Yay. It had been like Much the, the first time in forever. <laughs> it's been a really, really long time, but it was really fun. It was a great musical experience. Yeah. Also, you had an interesting experience just with like people you didn't know, but knew who you were because that was wild. Of the podcast. <laughs> we're so glad. For every single one of you guys listening, yes. I cannot even tell yes. you. It means so much. Yes. And we love you all. We love and adore every one of you. Yes. Right. Yes. Here, here. And I will just say, too, this is kind of a funny story about our week together. Stephanie came down. She hasn't played this job in quite a while. And it was really a treat to get to spend the week with her. But in this particular orchestra, a lot of the people in the orchestra already list the podcast because it's just through word of mouth. And some of our previous guests play down there. And so there's some synergy there. But it was amazing because Stephanie showed up with her new stickers. And she's just like, Hey, have a sticker. Hey, have a sticker. Have a sticker. <laughs> and it got me thinking that it would be really cool for those of you who are like our super fans. Can you let us know if you would hand out stickers if we sent you our little new stickers promotionally? Yeah. We would send you a handful and you could give them to your friends and just like spread the word about the new rebrand and what we do. And it would help us out a lot, like have our little ambassadors out there. I love that idea. Right? I was a little guerrilla marketing. It's like literally what you were doing yeah. all week. <laughs> yes. And it was adorable yes. and it made me feel bad. I'm because... so sorry. If you're a new listener and I put you off by, you know, <gasps> accosting you with a sticker, well, you're welcome because you're here now. <laughs> it was so great. It was so great. I but loved it so much. just to show you what like having a friend who's like a really big extrovert will do for you. It like kind of bleeds off and I'm like, you know what? The stakes aren't really that high. <laughs> That's amazing. I mean, what's funny is, yeah, I felt sh I felt ashamed of my extroversion networking self because I don't I have admittedly not really done that before. It took your introverted podcast partner. I was just watching you down watching like, you back there doing your thing. I was like, yeah, this is like, I mean, I don't know you, but here's a sister. <laughs> There's hope for us introverts. Yeah. So. Oh, you're already great as you are. You don't need to do a thing. Welcome to the Musician Centric Podcast. We are two freelance violists living and laughing our way through conversations that explore what it means to be a professional musician in today's world. I'm Steph. And I'm Liz. And we're so glad you've joined us. Let's dive in. Mm -hmm. 
So as you may know, well, if you're new here, you don't know. We have this amazing community called Joy Loves Company, Mm -hmm. which we started a couple of years ago to do Susanna Klein's Practisma practice journal. And we had a group of about, I don't know, a few wonderful, amazing people Mm -hmm. who joined us for that journey. And then last year we did The Artist's Way, (laughs) which was intense. Yep. And amazing. (laughs) Totally amazing. And we had more people join us in that journey. (laughs) Even more people. So we're looking to break records with this Joy Loves (laughs) Company group. Yes. And the great news is that we are doing the book that was written by our guest who we're having today. So her book is called Creative Success Now. And it's all about helping creative people find their true path based on their strengths, their values, everything that you're going to hear in today's episode. But her book is all about that. So we thought we'd do that. Yeah. And there are some exercises to do in there, some things for discussion. It's really great. I think this came up actually in our conversation with Astrid, but it feels sort of like this adapted 21st century version of the artist way, which is really nice and practical. Mm-hmm. And that's a good way to put yeah, it. Yeah. I really like the fact that it's sort of directed toward reasonable expectations for what our life looks like right now and how to sort of embrace the challenges we face making a living doing this, which is not an easy thing to do. So I think it's really great and just such a positive, inspiring thing that we would be able to take this journey with our group. The group has been such a delight. It was a real surprise for us because we really got the motivation to do Practisma by having Susanna on the podcast. And I had worked through this journal with my students before, but just to have this group of really insightful, kind, warm people meeting every week to just discuss their own journey going through something like that with the challenge, the life stories that end up coming up as a result of it. And then the artist way kind of even just amplified that experience for people. So it's really exciting to think about how year three would go with our Joy Loves Company group. And we want to invite all of you to consider joining us. In order to join, all you have to do is head to our Patreon and you sign up at the $5 a month level. And once you do, you get all the information. You'll get a Zoom link to the weekly meetings, which are going to begin on Tuesday, November 28th, right after the Thanksgiving holiday. You'll also get invited to a Facebook group we have. And really, it's always been sort of a highlight of our weeks to spend this half an hour, 40 minutes with our group every week talking about these things and just hearing perspectives. And it's a lot of fun. So you're encouraged to join. Yes, please join us. It's a lot of fun. And I really do feel like everyone is going to be able to get something out of this book. So even if you feel like you have your thing nailed down, you know, you're doing what you want to be doing a little bit of self exploration, you can never go wrong with that. So oh my gosh. And, And even if you feel like you're late in your career, there's no time for me to change now. There's no way for me to add to my professional enterprises. You can still get something out of this. And Astrid actually is a great model for that. Yeah, absolutely. And also for any of you like me who sometimes maybe possibly don't always get our homework done. I don't know what that's like. I know you don't. Thank (laughs) God for you. Thank God for you. (laughs) I just want all of you to know that there's no shame here. (laughs) Oh, no, it's so laid back, you guys. Sometimes you just haven't done your homework. It's really okay. That happens actually a lot in our group. (laughs) Still come. You should still come. Because we're like that friend that sits like right (laughs) next to you in class that'll kind of like tilt their paper a little bit so you you can see their answers. Yes. We'll do that for you. That's right. And I will also say this was true. There were some periods, phases of my year last year where sitting down to really like be with the work that was required in the artist way was very hard for me to do. It was just a real challenge given my current life situations. And yet week after week, every chapter we would delve into and we would talk about and I'd be like, oh, I'm going through this thing at this moment internally. I'm realizing this thing or I'm learning this thing or it's so interesting how like all of these these little components, the book itself, the discussions that are had, the realizations that your friends in the group are having, they all inform each of us in some way. And that's why, you know, I'm glad you said, Stephanie, that everyone can get something out of it. If you have a great amount of experience with this, you'd be such an asset to the group because you'd be able to share those experiences with people. And it's just really, it's a lot of fun. Great community, great material. So please, please join us. It's going to be a lot of fun. And 
And other ways that you can support our little podcast are by getting some merch. So you can get merch through our website, which will take you directly to Ensemble Outfitters. Lisa will hook you up. And then, of course, you can share this podcast. (laughs) Please rate, review, do all those things that podcasters always ask you to do because it really does help. Yes. Anyway, speaking of playing to your strengths, our guest today (laughs) wrote a book all about that. Yes, she did. And not only did she write a book, but oh my gosh, this woman is just amazing. She has a really incredible career from being in the legal profession to arts administration to education. And she's a fierce advocate of the creative life and has really created a place, I think, for creative people to find resources that would help them with their projects, just with the things they want to do, the things they want to accomplish. Understanding that each one of us is the only person on this earth that can say the thing we're saying and recognizing that as such a strength and that it belongs in a place somewhere. You know, everybody's voice belongs somewhere. So yeah, it was so inspiring to talk to her, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah, she's amazing. I kind of think of her as like your career fairy godmother. Mm -hmm. Yes. (laughs) You go see her and she asks you questions. She puts exactly the right dress on you, gives you the means to get there. And yeah, just like has that magic fairy dust. She knows exactly how to describe the process to you too. And I just, I love the idea that, you know, we're all unique individuals and we don't fit into one of these two boxes that I grew up thinking that I had to fit into as a musician. Like either I was going to be a performer or I was going to be a teacher. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of other really cute hand made boxes that you could be in. So many. So many cute Individual. little handmade boxes. So, many boxes. <laughs> so we're here to help you find the right box for you. <laughs> That's terrible. That was, it's more like a like a platform, like a vehicle, yeah. like yeah. your mode of transportation. <laughs> your own bespoke ball gown. <laughs> this is no this isn't this sorry. Is, this is, it's really bad. It's really we're bad. We're doing a great job. <laughs> Do you know what I will say is this was a very interesting thing for my, like my internal experience when we were talking to her was she was speaking so succinctly about some certain strengths. And I think there's some characteristics in terms of leadership I've been thinking about lately. And I don't know if this will resonate with anybody, but I've just been thinking about like what it means to be a leader, because I think I'm not trying to brag about myself, but I feel like I often get encouraged or placed in positions where I am expected to take on this leadership role. And I've never really felt all that connected to the idea of being a quote leader because I have this concept in my mind that a leader is the person who like makes the decisions and you know charges forward and Mm -hmm. I I never want to be a person that's just like sitting somewhere up by myself with a bunch of other people just waiting for me to tell them what to do that is like a really uncomfortable thing for me but something about the way she said in terms of like the synergizing of ideas and then I took it and I was thinking about these other areas of my life and I think Susan Susanna Klein was actually giving me a little bit of the same concept. It has been introduced to me a few times. And I wonder if it's this like exploration of what feminine leadership looks like as opposed to just like, quote, leadership. That's a really poignant idea. Right? We have such like a patriarchal view of what a leader is because men have been in leadership roles. Yes. But there is a feminine alternative. Yes. And and it's it definitely is rooted, I believe, and this has started to really resonate with me with this concept that the leader is simply like a conduit or a vehicle to pull the rest of the team together. And those ideas all come together in a way that it really works well for whatever the endeavor is that's being attempted to be accomplished. And I just, yeah, that felt so much more comfortable to me. But anyway, I really felt like without even taking the test yet, which by the way, we've got a couple links, one that was recommended to us by Astrid in the conversation. And then she also has her own that's, I think, a little more comprehensive. I think the one she recommended online is a little simpler. But anyway, I haven't even taken them yet. But I felt like even just her talking, I was like, Oh, I think that's I think that's something I do really well. Or, you know, she would just throw out these examples and it, it really resonates. So yeah, I think that idea of her being like an ultimate person who synthesizes ideas is accurate. Yeah, we'll put that link in our show yeah. notes. So you can head over there and take that. Too. Yeah, we're going to take but- it. Right. And we're going to share our, we're going to share our results. We're going to share for better or worse. I mean, they're all strengths, right? So that can only be positive. (laughs) They're only going to be awesome. Okay. Okay. Yes. We're going to share them proudly. (laughs) 
proudly. That's right. But anyway, just like our Patreon group, just like our uh, Joy Loves Company group, we think everybody's going to have something that you're going to pull from this conversation. It was just so electric. And there were just so many great points that really resonated with me personally, I know with you. And I have a feeling that you, the listener, reader, will love this conversation too. So enjoy this little chat with Astrid Baumgartner. It's that time of year. We're back to school and we are back to gigging. Even if you're not mentally ready for the season, you can count on our season sponsor, Potter Violins, to get your equipment ready. When's the last time you rehaired your bow, stuff? Oh, I feel like it was recently, but I bet it's been over six months. So I got to get over there and get it freshened up. Oh, and I need new backup strings and an instrument adjustment. Sounds like it might be about time. Yeah. I do love to get in there for a visit to our favorite technicians as we approach the change of season. Hmm, maybe I need a new case, too. (laughs) And as we've said before, if you need a rental instrument, they're the place to go. My daughter and many of my students rent from Potters, and the instruments are really fantastic, even the smaller violas. Yes. Get back to your music this season with confidence by visiting Potter Violins so your equipment will be ready, even if you might need a bit more of a warm-up. Our guest today is Astrid Baumgartner. Astrid loves helping creative people to be successful. A lawyer, career coach, speaker, and author of the book, Creative Success Now, she teaches career entrepreneurship at Yale University's School of Music. A professional speaker, Ms. Baumgartner recently gave a TEDx talk on cracking the code on creativity, the secret to full blast living. And as president of her coaching company, Ms. Baumgartner works with arts leaders who want to be authentic, powerful leaders. And professional musicians and creative entrepreneurs who want career success and happier, more fulfilling lives like us all. (laughs) It is such a pleasure and honor to welcome you to the Musician Centric Podcast. Liz and I have both read your book, Creative Success Now, and we are so excited to get into it with you. You know, we have been struggling through these questions and this journey for our whole careers. And it's just so lovely to read this little condensed, think about this, think about that. Yeah. But you have been all over the map in your career. You've been a lawyer, you've been an arts administrator, you've been a career coach. And I know that you really truly believe that authenticity in your life and in your career has led you to where you are. So I wonder if you can talk a little bit about what brought you to this point in your career. Thank you, Steph and Liz, so much for that very kind introduction. And thank you so much for reading my book, Mm -hmm. because I did pour my heart into that to help creative people be successful. Hence the name of the book, Creative Success Now. You're absolutely right about the whole notion of authenticity. That is one of my top values. And I didn't discover any of this until I was well into my career. So I started off as a musician as a little kid, always loved music. And then, you know, sort of did the practical thing and went to law school, Mm -hmm. right? Instead of pursuing something creative. Sure, your parents were very happy. <laughs> they were very happy, very happy. And, you know, even back then, I didn't really think of myself as a very creative person. I was a good student, right? And I was, I learned well, right? And so I did my thing as a lawyer, but it sort of never felt like the right thing, to be very honest. And in the first nine years of my legal career, I worked at four different law firms, just thinking, well, it's the firm, it's not me. But then when I had two very small children, a one-year-old and a three-year-old, I started working for this French law firm, which dovetailed with my college major of French and my love of French language and culture. And so that seemed like a pretty good fit because it was also very part-time. So I felt very lucky that I was able to raise my children and still keep a toehold in the professional world. But as my children got older, it just didn't feel, again, like the right fit. And once they were in high school, I started volunteering at arts organizations. I figured, let me do something that I believe in. Because the law, as intellectually interesting as it is, just didn't feel like it was my mission. So I started volunteering at these arts organizations and found that, wow, it is so exciting to be around people who are passionate about the arts like me. And the other thing that was interesting is the kind of thinking that you need to run an arts organization. It's a very different sort of skill set from being a lawyer. Being a lawyer is very analytical and they, they want you to kind of stay in your lane. I mean, at the very highest levels, yes, there are creative lawyers, but not where I was doing 
doing. I was doing big corporate law. And instead, you know, here in the arts, there's just a lot of room for creativity and for collaboration and strategic thinking. And those things seem to be what I was good at. And once my kids were about, my son was about to go to college, my daughter was two years behind, it gave me the courage to say, it is now my time. And so I left law and was able to start working for a French cultural organization and language school. It's a very large nonprofit in New York City called the French Institute d'Alliance Française. It's kind of a great fit because it dovetailed with my love of French, my love of culture. And I was thrown six departments to run and figure it out. Uh And there was a lot, yeah, there was a lot of figuring it out because while I had done some management at my French law firm, I was never in this position, but I sort of figured it out. And it was really interesting because my definition of a nonprofit is big dreams, no resources, right? And still, right? And that's exactly what it was. And so we did all kinds of interesting things. And I found it was very creative because with the no resources, you have to be very nimble and very creative trying to leverage people, figuring out what they're good at and putting together the right teams. And I never went to business school. I just sort of figured this stuff Mm -hmm. out. You know, it was kind of interesting learning on the job. And at the same time, when I left law, I began joining a different set of arts organizations. I joined the American Composers Orchestra because I'm very passionate about contemporary music and I love composers. So within two years of my joining that board, I was elected chair of the board. So I had these two leadership things going on. It was really interesting. And this is when I started getting a glimpse of what does it mean to be authentic, right? It means doing things you love. It means doing things that you're good at. It means doing things you're passionate about, right? And so I was, you know, humming along at the French Institute, realizing that it was time after three years, because I was the deputy executive director, and I felt it was time for me to either take on my own organization or go off and do something else. And then the universe stepped in and I got downsized because of a recession. So that was kind of interesting. And for the first time in my life, I actually took a break from work. So for six months, I just said, I am not doing anything. I'm just going to explore and see what happens. And so I met this really interesting fellow who they were interviewed me for a big job at Lincoln Center, which I did not get. But I really love this guy who's a management consultant. And we then formed a partnership. And we did that for a year. And that was an interesting experience because I learned a lot about how to start a business and took a lot of notes on what was going on and what I thought could have been done better. And then I left that. And then I sort of wandered around. And then, yeah, un- unfortunately, I had a very bad health episode that kind of took me out of the running. And interestingly, I spent a month in the hospital, including two weeks in a coma. Mm -hmm. It was, yes, it, it was pretty traumatic particularly for my family and my friends. And I woke up on my birthday and I sort of took that as a sign. Oh, that's crazy. That I was it truly meant to come back for a reason. And literally I was, you know, in the ICU hooked up to like 17 tubes and my mother walked in with a chocolate cake. Now there was no way I could eat it, but she said, happy birthday, darling. And, you know, I went, ah, my birthday. And then I looked around going, where am I? Literally, it was pretty crazy. And so I had a lot of physical rehab that I had to go through a lot of surgery. Surgery. And then six months after leaving the hospital, I was recovering from another surgery and I was on my couch and I heard a voice that said, Astrid, you need to get up off that couch and help people with their life transitions. So I discovered coaching. Literally, that's how I discovered it. It was crazy. And within a month, I was enrolled in coaching school and I became a coach. And my coaching school was a very interesting place because they taught us great coaching skills as well as, well, if you're going to go out and do this, how do you start a business doing this? Right. And they said, mm-hmm. you have to have a niche. So my niche was twofold, creative women lawyers like me, and also young conservatory trained musicians. Because during my wandering period, I went back to studying piano pretty seriously with a teacher at Juilliard and a young guy, I think he was 26 when we began studying, right? I called him my boy genius piano teacher, who is now the dean of the Boston Conservatory. Hey. We unbelievable. <laughs> Very close friends. You yeah, knew him just, when. Yeah. yeah, he was bo- my boy genius, right? He's so cool. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, and I really had a deep love for my piano teacher and his friends. And so I started coaching them and doing workshops at Juilliard. And interestingly, my coaching school, they said one night we had a class and the, the teacher introduced himself. He said, hi, I'm Jim. I'm a lawyer, a talent scout and a coach. And I teach a course at Fashion Institute of Technology in New York. And a light bulb went off in my head. And I said, I want to teach. I want to teach at Juilliard or maybe even Yale. And I wrote this in my journal. In five years, I am teaching at a conservatory like Juilliard, parentheses, or maybe even Yale, (laughs) close parent, 
period. So amazing. Next day I wake. Yeah. I mean, really, you know, and I had not read the secret or any of that stuff, but I just like <laughs> that was going to happen. And so literally I woke up the next day and went, okay, if that's going to happen in five years, I need to get to work. So I started doing more career workshops at Juilliard and I eventually built up literally the equivalent of a course. And I pitched myself to Yale and I knew the Yale School of Music people because we attend the Yale Summer Music Festival at Norfolk, Connecticut. And so I knew the director who happened to be the deputy director of the Yale School of Music and said, you know, I'm doing all this career work at Juilliard and I would really love to come to Yale. And his answer was, your timing is excellent because we need somebody. And so I created a curriculum and they hired me to teach the class. And then they said, oh, and by the way, would you like to create our new Office of Career Strategies? So I got hired both as faculty and staff at the Yale School of Music in three years. Amazing. So that was pretty. So my point in all this is I think it's really important to have those authentic big dreams, those dreams that reflect what you love and what your values are and what your mission is, you know? And I think that that kind of passion and energy translates into the world. Like if you're able to appreciate that and communicate that, I think people get really excited. And I this is the fundamental thing that I teach is actually what I really start with is a positive mindset, okay? Mm. So I have to say I am very lucky because I was born very positive. <laughs> My mother is a very positive woman, and I just absorbed that from her, and I'm very grateful because it has led me through a lot. I mean, I was in the hospital for a month, practically dead, right? But I just knew I was going to get better, um, and it's it's been with me my whole life. So there are things we can do to become happier and more positive, and so that's the first thing I teach people. Yeah, is, you know. Yeah, can I just say though? Yeah, this please. is so it's so amazing to me. I'm going to back up a little bit in your sure. origin story, oh. as they say. I think this is an inspiring thing for people to hear, which is why I'm kind of circling back to it. But you spent many years in a career that yes. felt like it wasn't the right one for you without knowing oh. yet, oh, this, is, this isn't this is really right. the path I meant to be on. And then you gave yourself that permission slip to do it. And I think it's yep. important for, for that to be recognized because so much of the time, I think we get on a conveyor belt somewhere and people just assume. Mm. And you always hear stories of people who, wanted to be a musician or wanted to do this or that right. and just never did. And right. and that shift for you to be brave to do it. I think you said, I finally gathered up enough courage to say, all right, yep. I'm going to give this a shot. And yep. um, that strikes me a lot because I admittedly, not that this has been the case in every aspect of my life, but I have admittedly many times been like, this doesn't sit right. This doesn't sit right. It doesn't take very long for me to be like, yeah, I got to figure this out you know, right. Um, right. It's that courage to make the change, you know, and follow that that's, authenticity. I think that's right. And, you know, I always say, I wish I'd had a me back then because, <sighs> you know, career, career coaching can really help. And that is why I wrote my book because process can really help. It doesn't give you answers. Like as a career coach, my job is not to give advice. It is not to give answers. It is to help you discover who are you at your core, at your best, and how can we use that to make your dreams happen? And then my job is to listen and I provide a lot of resources and feedback and try to help people reframe a lot of challenge as opportunity. And I think that's where positivity comes in. It's being able to see a challenge and say, just like what you just said, Liz, and what am I going to do about it? Am I going to just sit with this or am I going to figure it out? Am I going to reach out to other people for help? Am I going to read something, take a course, you know, try something new? And there's no question, I experimented an awful lot, right? Okay. And in fact, in my TED Talk, one of the things I talked about is that if you want to embrace your creative side, sometimes you have to go on an, a life experiment and just see what might be a possibility for you. <laughs> and that's why there's such a connection to me between creativity and positivity. And one of my missions in life, I mean, one of the things that I did after the pandemic was I enrolled in a year-long course in the science of happiness mm -hmm. and became a certified happiness facilitator. And what I'm trying to do now in my work is to bring greater happiness and joy into the creative space, because I think there's such potential for creative people to be happy. I mean, just think about musicians. Talk about resilience, right? Okay, that audition didn't work. Let me try another one. That didn't work. Okay, I'm going to try this other thing. I mean, phenomenal. And resilience is such an important aspect of happiness, mm -hmm. right? Having mm -hmm. the sense of purpose, feeling like this is what I'm meant to do. That is such an important aspect of having a happy life, being able to collaborate and work with other people and have really great relationships, being intellectually curious and growing. All of these are aspects of happiness. And that is one of the interesting things that I learned in my happiness studies is that happiness is not just, oh, I'm in a great mood because we're not always in a great mood. And it's being able to accept the ups and the downs and then finding the way towards optimism. So that's why I always start in helping people 
people is with that mindset. Like, yeah, right. Absolutely. It's so important. I think a lot of us in the, at least we're orchestral musicians. So a lot of the drive of our career is, okay, I'm going to win an orchestra job. Right. Or for anyone else, I'm going to get that promotion. Right. I'm going to reach that next level in my work environment and then I will be happy. Right. But it's really not, it's kind of the backwards way to think about it, right? Yep. That's so interesting because there's so much research on, I love this. If you want to give a tagline to it, happiness breeds success instead of success breeds happiness. Because if if you're chasing that promotion, you're chasing that orchestra job, you're chasing that million dollar salary and you're not enjoying it. By the time you get there, it's like, okay, I got that goal on to the next. You can't even appreciate it, enjoy it. Whereas what the research shows us is if you are enjoying what you're doing and working towards a goal that feels meaningful, you're going to feel a lot better about what you're doing, which means you're going to be doing a better job. And a lot of the research takes place in the corporate workplace, right? So if you're doing a good job, you tend to get promoted, right? And if you get tend to get promoted, you make more money, but there's more. If you are the kind of person that is really so excited about what you're doing, you tend to give off a good vibe to other people and they enjoy working with you. So you cultivate better relationships. If you're a leader, you have better relationships. People respect you, all kinds of things. And then in the personal life, better health, mental health and physical health and emotional health, better relationships, you know, friendship, marriage, you know, longevity, aging. So interesting about happiness, breeding success. So I'm so glad, Steph, that you said that because it's borne out by the research. Yeah. And Mm -hmm. I love this too, because I would also say, and I believe I got this from my grandmother, because when Mm -hmm. I think about my immediate family, I'm like a total unicorn in this way. Um, I was born like with a really full cup of positivity too. I can't explain it. I can't explain it Mm -hmm. any other way. I just... I'm just wired that way. I know sometimes I absolutely drive my friends crazy with it and it just is what it is. But I, I've really come to notice that when we are stuck in sort of like a loop of negativity, it's easy to it's easy to stay there. And, you know, we've talked about this before on the podcast and done a little bit of research ourselves on the negativity bias and how our brains are actually kind of mm. wired that way. They are yep. wired to see threats. They're wired to see danger. They're wired to assume the worst in order to survive. And so, you know, I don't know, maybe that means in the primitive years, we wouldn't have done very well because we would have just been like, everything's fine. It's going to be good, you know? (laughs) But what's interesting is even when my happiness takes a big hit, and I've had a couple experiences in life where that's been the case, and it's been really tough, I feel like it really is this belief or this work that things are okay, that things are going to be better, yeah. that, yes. you know, there's, yes. there's, there are things for me to be happy about, be grateful for. And that keeps me going. And the more you work with that, the more it compounds on itself. And it is yes. true. Like, I don't think of it as an asset enough, but I know that, you know, the energy that you give to other people, it creates better relationships. It creates better opportunities. There's, there's so much there. That's a rich thing to say. And so I just thought I'd echo that one. Yeah, no, but it's so mm-hmm. true. And there's so many things I can add on to that. So there's a really interesting piece of research about positivity in leaders. And there's this one characteristic of leaders who are literally, they have the same exact resume, same exact experience. One leader is going to be four times more effective than similarly situated person. The person who can walk into the room and bring positivity and raise the level of positivity around him or her. And that, there's a new book that's coming out very soon by a colleague of mine at Yale, Emma Sapala, and Kim Cameron at University of Michigan to document this and the studies that they've done, which is really interesting. And so you and I, Liz, we're the lucky ones. We got, we got born with this, right? The, a dose of fairy dust. But there's a lot we can do to make ourselves happier. You know, there's some yes. more research from a fascinating psychologist, Sonia Lubomirsky, who wrote this great book for the popular press called The How of Happiness. And she explains that 50% of our capacity for being happy is genetic, right? Like you and me. 10% comes from our life circumstances where we're born, socioeconomic levels and the like. And then 40% is within our capacity. So that's not so bad that you can use that 40% to learn practices, right? And to then create habits that inculcate greater happiness. And the other really interesting thing, strengths, what are you good at? Let's face it, my friends, we live in a culture where we're constantly being compared to other people, (laughs) where you get performance Mm -hmm. reviews that are, you know, slashing everybody down. And what positive psychologists say and strengths researchers say, 
that it's better to focus on your strengths, on the things that you are good at, the things that energize you, and devoting time and resources to getting better at what you're already good at. And once you know what you're good at, you can then privilege that, you know? And in my class at Yale, it's really interesting. I have my students take the strength assessment, and then we form collaborative groups, and they actually we actually have a strengths meeting. That's what we're doing this week on Wednesday cool. in my class. Yeah, it's so cool, because we've already formed our collaborative groups, and we're going to have this brainstorm, and then I'm going to create the to-do list and pass out the tasks and the timeline, right? Those are the doers. And then we've got the relationship people who say, right? No, but it's awesome <laughs> to have different strengths on a team. That's the whole point, right? Because when you allow people to leverage their strengths, then that is half the battle in getting something great out of the collaboration. You know, I love this, this whole strengths assessment yes. and finding out what you're good great. at and giving you the permission to kind of let go of some of the things that you're not quite so yes, good at. Exactly. What if, I'm just thinking about this. Yeah. How tragic that you have to wait until you're in college to figure this yeah, out. Right. Or, if, or if you're like a professional, totally. yes. you know, in, in one field and you're like, okay, now let me figure out what my strengths yeah, you're are. You're middle-aged and you're like, oh, now yes, I know okay, my strengths. Let me go. <laughs> That was me, my friends. Same. I know. <laughs> right? It's wonderful that you got yes. there. But yeah. how many people yeah. are just forcing their yes. square peg into this yes. oh my gosh. circle? Right? <laughs> yes. Right. Like if you're a real people person and there you are in a cubicle filling out Excel spreadsheets. <laughs> Right? I would that never, would I wouldn't right. last more than two <laughs> right? weeks at that job. For sure. For sure. Well, exactly. so in your book, you have a strengths assessment yeah. that you can, you can yep. access. Yep. So, and I even how- found another one. So I want to share this one. Ooh. Oh, yes. Tell it's, us. It's Everything. All the things. Free. Because oh, the one I is, I love the one that I recommend. It's now called Clifton Strengths, and it's great. It's research out of Gallup with millions of people around the world. But I found this other one called High Five Test, H I G H Five Test, mm-hmm. and it's free. And so the Gallup one gives you your top five strengths out of thirty-four. High Five is is top five out of twenty, and it's a much shorter test. A Gallup I think is two hundred forty questions. High Five is a hundred yeah. questions, and it's not timed, so you don't have to sweat it out because Gallup is timed if you don't answer default and high stress yeah that and so terrible yeah yeah right i know that's actually my preferred one yeah. because i think it's a little more accurate but the high five i now do that with my students so they don't have to buy the book you know and spend the money they can just take the uh, assessment so well, we all do, your listeners do both and see my, yeah well, yeah do yeah, both please. there's so I, much good stuff i'm, I'm an assessment geek i've taken gallup four times and taking high five twice <laughs> To see the overlap. It's so funny. But it's so exciting to even think about that. Yeah. I'm excited to apply these concepts with something like auditioning because Oh yeah. I really feel like it's so challenging in the same way we're having these discussions. When you're training in that way, you're sort of left to the strategies that worked for the people who are training you to do it, right? Exactly. And the general exactly. strategies that are shared with with you by your teachers. And they're only sharing this knowledge with you because it's what's worked for them. And that's really helpful helpful. It's really helpful. But the thing is, I 100% resonate with this feeling of every time I try to go through that process, I'm putting myself in some sort of box that doesn't feel right because I'm trying right. to build a strength that's not a strength. You know, I'm trying yeah. to yeah. I'm trying to exacerbate yeah. some sort of weakness to make it better when really yeah. what would it look like if we took our own strengths in these types of situations and we just leaned into them and figured out yes. how that makes it. Yes you know, work yes. for us. and So, you know, very- at Yale, I ran the career office for 10 years and did a lot of career coaching, both individual and group. And I continue to mentor a lot of students in the career area, particularly the ones that show up at Yale and think, okay, I'll go for an orchestra job, but it just doesn't feel right. And feeling very forlorn that they don't know what other opportunities exist for them. Right. And then that's my coaching with them to see, well, okay, what do you love doing? What are you good at? What? And if they don't know, then to send them out on the exploration to say, great, use your time at Yale to explore and take in the data. So when you're in, you know, when you've tried a new ensemble, okay, how was that? How did you enjoy the people, the repertoire, the whole setup, right? And if you like that, do more of that. If you didn't like it, try something else, you know? Yeah. There's a really great anecdote in your book about Ashley from Australia. Absolutely. Who, you know, came here to get his graduate degree. And can you tell us a little the story? It's so good. It's one of my favorite stories. So he was, uh, he is a super talented, fabulous person.
person. I just adore him. He was really frustrated because he kind of didn't know what to do with his career. And he so his teacher said, well, apply for orchestras, you know, do auditions. And he just could not motivate himself to practice those excerpts. It just did not feel right. And in the second week of class, we go through a values assessment. That's their homework. This was a light bulb moment for him because his values were things like lifelong learning and creativity and self-realization. And he said, no wonder I don't want to do these excerpts. It just doesn't feel like me. And again, in conversation with him, well, what feels like you? He said, you know, I love working with our composers here at Yale and working on new commissions and premiering new work. And my dream is to do that. I'd like to go back to Australia and be sort of a new music cultivator and commissioner and performer. And that just so totally energized him. I mean, it was a pretty quick turnaround. And he spent the rest of his time at Yale collaborating with our composers because we have a really great composition program. And I went to his final recital, which was just unbelievable. It was all this new work and video and he had costumes and all of his classmates who worked with him were all had made this great makeup and they all dressed the part. I mean, it was so amazing, mm. right? It was a, sh he put on a show basically. And what's so interesting is, so he wanted to go back to Australia and he applied to this university and was accepted and not just accepted to their doctoral program, but they said, oh, and because of all the work you've done with composers, we want you to be in charge of our new music ensemble. So he gets to go back to Australia to become a professor and to run new music and he and I still keep in touch and he sends me videos of what he's doing. And this is the funniest thing because now he's actually soloing with orchestra because he's premiering so much work. So he's got an amazing career that he loves. He teaches at this university and runs the new music ensemble, works with composers, premieres and solos as a clarinetist. So it's it's a great story. It's a great story. It's a, the power of knowing your values and, and aligning your life. Yeah with your values. Yeah. So from the acknowledgement or the recognition of your strengths to get to values and then principles beyond them. Um, yes. We've had a sampling of this idea, this concept before years ago, when we were in our baby stage of the podcast, we had a conversation with a good friend of ours who's also does values-based identity coaching. And it was such an energizing conversation because it's such a way to ground yourself in decision-making. So any perspectives that you have, Astrid, that you want to share with us about the identification of your values in particular. Oh, abs absolutely. Would be awesome. First of all, <laughs> I will send you my values assessment, okay? Oh, great. So, Yay for assessments. We might love yes. them all. <laughs> Yes, this one I made up, and I made it up based on the one I first took, and it's kind of a funny story. So the, the, the idea here is that you look through this list of what I call yummy values. They're all you know great values, and very honestly go through them and say, so what really matters to me? Where have I made decisions where I've used these values? Where have I had situations where something was not right? Somebody did something, said something that really upset me, and what value was not was not present? You know That sort of thing. And so get it down to your top 10 and down to your top five. Now, why? your top five. I always say the values are like your core principles. Like if you had a t-shirt that said Liz or stuff, I stand for one, two, three, four, five. So if you're aiming for values to help you with decision making, which I think is really helpful. If you have 20 values, you're all over the place, right? <laughs> and so you have to crunch it down. I and don't like to my choose. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't either. So let me tell you that story. So the first time someone handed me a similar values assessment, I freaked out because <laughs> like, I want all I of these. Because they're all I, desirable. These are all my values. <laughs> they're all A and B. I got to have the perfect set of values, right? Because I, I have that streak. I confess I'm a recovering perfectionist, my friends. And then I went, it was a coach that I was working with. And so I went to her the next session. She said, okay, what are your values? I said, oh, I don't know. She said, come on, just pick. And so I just picked five and they were authenticity, relationships, creativity, excellence, and self-care. Okay. After my health episode, I just right. decided I got to take care of me before I can take care of all of you. Right. Yeah. It just sort of came out. Right. So it's very intuitive anyway. But the other thing is on my list, I'll just give you all a heads up. There are lots of words for relationships, right? There's relationship, friendship, love, intimacy, ro you know, romance. There's also community and fellowship. And so if you find yourself checking off a lot of those relationship type words, just pick one and then say, this bucket is my relationship value, right? Yeah. Another one, learning. There's a lot of learning value. 
lives. Lifelong learning is one of my top. And I define for me, lifelong learning means I'm creative. I challenge myself. I go for adventure. And so that's my bucket. So if you're the kind of person that just loves to learn and there are all these different aspects of learning, wisdom, expertise, right? Pick one and that's your learning bucket, right? And then there's another really interesting one, authenticity, which is one of my top values. So a lot of, a lot of people pick that, just say, I want to be the real me, right? But some people take it a step further and say, well, what does it mean for me to be authentic? And then there might be a bunch of those values in there that define you as your authentic self. And that can be your authenticity value, you know? So that would be my way of helping people find their values. And then, as I said, values should not just sit on the shelf, right? How do we align with those values? So I have an interesting exercise that I do with my class and in my leadership trainings where I have people define what a value means. Okay, you picked authenticity. What does that mean? And then write out a principle that says, I stand for and use your definition. Then take that and commit to taking an action that shows that you actually do align with that principle. Oh, can you give us an example? Sure. Of what okay. some people have done for their action? Yeah, sure. Okay, I'll do mine. Lifelong learning. I stand for lifelong learning. And my definition is I'm creative. I challenge myself. I learn every day. That's my principle. So that means that every day I'm going to read something or I'm going to learn something or I'm going to do something in a different way. Things like that. So good. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. because it feels real. Yes. You know? yes. And it feels personal. Yes. Oh, for sure. For and sure. it's not just something that I know I've been guilty of going to a lesson or to a class and doing whatever the teacher said almost blindly. I mean, because when you're in college, when you're a student, you don't know yourself. Right. Going to a lesson and just doing whatever the mm. teacher told me blindly as if it was a prescription. Right. Like you have this illness, <laughs> so you right. take this prescription <laughs> right? and My you goodness. do it. Yeah. And, you know, I just did it because sure. that was me, like straight A student. And right. I do what the teacher tells me to do. And I did those things, but you don't get nearly as much bang for your buck unless they're personalized to you specifically, right? right? To your values. And you have to tailor things to get the most yeah, out that's of them. So, yeah. Yeah. That's so good. I feel a very similar resonance to that. Although on my end, it was like, then faced with this crippling guilt because I wouldn't necessarily successfully complete the prescription. And I would just think, okay, I'm this failure yeah. because I can't do the thing that's expected of me. But really, it's like not the way I'm wired. And it would right. have been so helpful right. to have. But I, I also, I mean, I'll throw this out there. I think that's an even more difficult, I think, challenge that we faced as women when we were younger, because there was just so much more of the that vibe of... Yep. You know, being I, you mentioned that one of the early projects you took on was for creative women lawyers. I can imagine there's right. a, a whole oh sub community there that, yeah. you know, needed this kind of support, needed this kind of awakening. Yeah, twofold. You know, it's interesting because I still have one lawyer client, but she left and she started a business, you know, and I've been her business coach. And it was just a really interesting process. She came to me as a baby lawyer in the middle of the financial crisis when she was terrified of getting fired. And so her goal was help me keep my job. And so <laughs> great, but what do you really want to do, you know? And she wasn't sure, but it was very much about her strengths. Let's play to your strengths. And so First of all, she was able to find work that was much more aligned with what she was good at. So she didn't get fired. She was getting promoted. She found a, a pro bono case. So a lot of law firms will take on a case just to do good, right? And they won't charge the clients anything just because it's a really important thing. And she got put on this big pro bono case and ultimately left the firm as, you know, in charge of this case as from a business side. Mm. It was just a very interesting thing. And then went to another organization through which she did her work and then decided, well, why are they taking all the fees here? I can do this on my own. So she's now got her own business. So that's pretty exciting. So I danced that with her and still continue to be her lawyer. Everybody else is a creative musician, an arts leader. But I want to go back to learning and copying our teachers, yeah. right? Because I think we can reframe this. In the yeah. beginning, when you don't know, you imitate, right? Mm, yep. You look to role models and you say, okay, if the teacher says do it that way, I will do it that way. And then Liz, obviously there was a little voice inside you that said, oh, this doesn't feel right. And to listen to that little voice and say, well, if this doesn't feel right, what does? Mm -hmm. Let me explore, you know? And it just reminds me of one of my favorite books. It's this little book called Steal Like an Artist by a graphic designer named Austin Kleon. Oh my God, I love this book. So I admire graphic artists, artists of any sort, because I cannot draw to save my life. And there's all these <laughs> 
awesome little drawings are so cool. But his point is steal like an artist. What does he mean? He means be Picasso, go to the Musée de l'Homme, look at African masks and then go home and, and paint Demoiselle d'Avignon and invent cubism. Like yes. he looked at those masks, he stole that idea and then he made it Picasso. And instead of imitating those masks and saying, okay, well, let me see what I, you know, he just struck out and did it. And I just think that's so brilliant for creative people. Steal like an artist, right? Go out and see what it is that resonates for you and then make it your own. It's such a great message. Yeah. I mean, that's what we do as artists. Exactly. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. 100%. Yeah, that's yeah. a, that is absolutely also something that if it were introduced more into the orchestral world might be really beneficial to us because <laughs> yeah, it, it does it is I mean we we're really like in a lot of ways I think it's starting to change we talk about this a lot as well but replicating the concept yes. of what someone said needed to be this particular symphony this style this way and yeah. it's always a little bit more fun when you feel like we're all doing a thing together it's really beautiful and blended but I feel like I'm doing it myself I feel like I'm right. contributing in yeah. this way it's it's, right. it's a challenge because of mm-hmm. the machine that we're behind but you yeah, know, yeah. it's interesting and you know, what you were saying earlier about values can drive decision making. I always say values are there for the hard decisions. The easy decisions you just sort of know, but the tough choices they have to make professionally, like what career path am I going to follow? Like if you really value security, the life of a freelance musician is not going to work for you. And I think there's no good or bad there. It's just who are you? Mm. I think that that can really drive decisions and in friendships and relationships, very much so. You see that in ensembles, successful ensembles. It's like a marriage. They are in sync. And actually, truly, in a chamber music setting, you are celebrating each person's strengths. Yes. And I remember we had a panel discussion once with the Moreau Quartet. I run a chamber music program. And we were asking them about rehearsal dynamics. Mm -hmm. You know, when you get when you get irritated with each other. Yeah. Because it happens, especially when they're teenagers doing it. And we were trying to point out all the things that, you know, ego gets in the way and that doesn't help with anything. And they, they gave so many answers that were like, for my quartet too, we're like, yeah, we should be doing that. We should be trying that. And one of the things they said is basically they never belabor any one person's weaknesses. If someone is having Mm. trouble with a passage, they just leave it alone. They really just leave it alone. And they just focus on all of the things that they can do better. And eventually those things work themselves out. However, that might look. Sometimes they say like it takes, maybe they adjust tempo somewhere so that someone can play it more easily. It's total respect. Mm. And it's, Yes. It is. That's yes. what makes that is what makes it so great. Yeah. So when you have an organization as big as an orchestra working for those values, that is a recipe for something pretty amazing. And yeah, it's, it's just great that we're living in a time where these things can be celebrated and yes. acknowledged. I'm thinking about this conversation right now and thinking if every one person is identifying these biggest important values to them, we're all going to have different ones. And how amazing is that? Because that means that as a collective, we are all exactly. contributing something that's unique to us that's important for everyone right it's yeah, just absolutely. really amazing yep and i think that's the the um secret of success and successful collaborations is that the members really respect each other's they respect each other's talents experience differences right mm-hmm. and understanding that it's through our diverse differences that we can bring so much more to the collaboration to really res- you know admire that and celebrate that instead of having a bunch of mini me's because that doesn't work no. that's and i think that's a problem with a lot of leaders who are insecure and therefore hire people and surround themselves with people who are just like them. So they never get a contrary opinion. Yeah, because it's uncomfortable yeah. to see someone else's strengths where you have weaknesses. Mm, yes, right. Right? Right. And if you just acknowledge Excel spreadsheets are just not my thing, <laughs> right? <laughs> Let me run a meeting, <laughs> right? Yeah, <laughs> first violinist in my quartet will laugh very hard at that one because he loves <laughs> spreadsheets. And Way to go. I'm more than happy Isn't... to hand them off. I have no problem Isn't... with that whatsoever. That sounds like, that sounds perfect, right? <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. This has been amazing, Astrid. This has been so great. This has been so great. Well, thank you. What, this is great. What's coming up for you? Do you have any exciting stuff coming up this year? I 
Oh, I have lots of exciting stuff. First of all, my class at Yale is just so great. I love my students and they're great. I live in New York City. I go to all these cool concerts, so that's very fun. I'm going to California for Thanksgiving to see my family, mm -hmm. so that's really fun. Just, you know, life is good. New York is back culturally, yeah. so that's exciting. Yeah. I, I, saw, I went to a phenomenal opera on Sunday. I saw Dead Man Walking at the Met. Ugh. Yes, we did that at the Kennedy Center what here. An, right? Isn't that an amazing opera? Yeah, yeah cool. It was just great. Oh, and I'm going to the farewell concert of the Emerson Quartet in a few weeks. Pretty epic. Yeah, they're amazing. <laughs> epic. Pretty epic. epic. It is. Yep. Yeah. So that's just in the next month. That's what I'm doing. So it's all good. Great. Yeah. Well, where can our listeners find you, find your book? Sure. So Creative Success Now, just go to Amazon or Barnes and Noble or any, wherever you get books and just put my name in there, Creative Success Now, it'll come up. Visit my website, astridbaumgardner.com. I have a lot of resources. I have blogs, videos, all kinds of things. If you're interested in joining my mailing list, I send out a quarterly newsletter where I feature some blogs and some other resources and you know just share what, what I'm doing and what I think can help all of you. And there'll always be something new because you're a a lifelong That's learner. Right. That's so it. there'll always be something new in the newsletter, right? Good one. Yes, it's true. Very much so because I can't write the same newsletter two times in a row. No way. <laughs> no way. Thank you so much, Astrid. Oh, this was This so has fun. been wonderful. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much for listening today. If you loved this episode, consider writing us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Thanks also to our season sponsor, Potter Violins. If you'd like to support the podcast and get access to bonus content, consider joining our Patreon community. You can buy all your musician-centric merch, including shirts, water bottles, koozies, and a variety of other fun items. Our theme music was written and produced by J.P. Wogeman and is performed by Steph and myself. Our episodes are produced by Liz O'Hara and edited by Emily McMahon. Thanks again for listening. Let's talk soon. Let's talk soon.